was a privilege to have Roy Avram with us. And um, before formally starting with Roy's talk, let's do some announcement for the uh, for the upcoming lecture series. And um, so there will be really really nice line of talks, uh, multi omics technology, computational, and biology that will be starting uh, April 28th. So please go on the single cell, single cell omic Germany website and you can easily register and see the, all the announcements. So um, uh, very, very, very nice uh, line of, of talks there. Uh, the upcoming one also into uh, the big event here in Germany will be the Lifetime Conference 2.0. So you can already also register online on the Single Cell Omic Germany uh, website. And uh, the third announcement that uh, I would like to do is on May 7th, um, uh, Rosarvento Tor Torma will be talking. Her, the, the, the title of her talk will be announced soon, but you can also already register it on the Single Cell Omic Germany uh, website. So with this, I would like to formally introduce Roy. Uh, Roy is assistant professor at the Weissmann, where he started his lab in uh, 2016. A Weissmann is an institution that you know pretty well because he studied there <laughs> before going to the Broad Institute. Uh, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty good track, right? So Weissmann, Broad Institute. And, uh, but actually, York, uh, Roy, Roy, Roy and I, we met uh, in 2015 because we kind of discovered we were just working on exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> in two different labs and never met before. And it was really amazing to see how two story in two labs pop up on studying uh, host, uh, a model pathogen, Salmonella, and a host model, macrophages. And I think it was, it, it folded very nicely because both story were so complementary to each other. And it really was, Roy's work was really a pioneering work for studying the interaction of salmonella and macrophages at the single cell level. And to understand how the, the race between a host and a pathogen is happening. And studying this at the single cell level is, uh, is an, absolute, uh, an absolute revolution in the field of single cell and host pathogen interaction. And Roy is really an absolute pioneer. Since then, and since he started his lab, he's really contributing to seminal work to do the convolution of bulk uh, RNA-seq and really lately to refine our understanding of a salmonella biology inside macrophage using dual RNA sequencing. So it's a very nice uh, combination between technology, transcriptomic driven, and a fundamental knowledge on the salmonella biology. And uh, Roy, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. Uh, I know that it's normally not a working day for you. So thanks a lot for taking the time for being with us. And uh, we, will, uh, we will have the pleasure to listen to your talk. And after, if you have questions, you can raise your hand in the, in the panel. You can also switch on your camera, ask a question, or just put the question on the chat. Uh, and I will, at the end, moderate the talk. Roy? The floor is yours, and we look we look forward hearing to you. Thanks a lot, Emmanuel, for the really nice introduction. Um, uh, so, uh, I would like to tell you about uh, what my lab has been doing in the last uh, five years. Um, I, I will try to go through two projects: uh, one that was already published, and one that is unpublished. Uh, let's see how it goes. Nina is pretty tough. She doesn't let me go over 45 minutes. No, I'm kidding. 35 minutes. <laughs> okay, so um, my lab is uh, working on uh, the interaction, as Emmanuel said, the, the interaction between intracellular bacteria and the, 
usually pathogenic bacteria and host cells. Most of the intracellular pathogenic bacteria, uh, like mycobacterium, uh, tuberculosis, listeria, salmonella typhi, um, they enter host cells, and this is a mechanism that actually allows them to cause systemic infection. Uh, the reason for that is that for many years it has been considered that uh, this intracellular niche provides um, an escape from a adaptive immunity and it protects the bacteria from uh, high doses of antibiotics. And here I put some of the models that we are working uh, with. On the right you can see uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, intracellular bacteria within uh, the sputum. Uh, they are residing within macrophages in the sputum. This is how these granulomas look like in the lung. And what you can see here that the bacteria really replicates in the intracellular environment. Uh, and then this is how they establish a, a, an infection foci. Uh, at some point, this will become a granuloma with necrosis and uh, extracellular replicating bacteria. And this is basically uh, the life cycle of all, all intracellular bacteria. You can see here examples of salmonella typhi in the spleen. And you can see the necrotic tissue the same way. And uh, this is 10 images of uh, Listeria growing inside a macrophage in this case. And you can see really the vacuole of the intracellular bacteria that they create in order to protect themselves in the intracellular environment. This introduces a paradox in a, that was dealt with for many years, uh, which is basically macrophages, which are the cells that are supposed to eliminate the bacteria, are actually crucial for the ability of the bacteria to uh, establish an um, infection. And I like this example because it's a really simple one and it's uh, one of the hallmarks of the, of the field where you can see uh, in this study, they uh, eliminated the phagocytes, uh, they depleted phagocytes. Um, and you can see that when you deplete the phagocytes, actually the bacteria is not able to establish infection. So. If you measure CFU after five days of infection, this is in, with Salmonella, you can see that the bacteria are not able to replicate and cause disease. This paradox has been the center of the host pathogen field uh, for many years. And uh, a lot of studies have been trying to look at both uh, the early stages of infection. So uh, upon the inoculation with the bacteria immediately, then there is a barrier, there's epithelial barrier that is supposed to uh, keep any pathogen outside of the body. Uh, but these bacteria are able to manipulate these processes and basically go through these uh, epithelial barriers, are either through the epithelial cells or um, phagocytes that are resident in the tissue. And usually what happens, uh, and this has been described by many studies, is that the bacteria will adhere to the cell uh, the cell will phagocytose the bacteria, and then something miracle uh, is happening. Uh, the bacteria recognizes that it's inside a host cell, and while the macrophage tries to fight the bacteria, it will induce its own virulence processes that allow it to basically subvert the host uh, toxic processes in order to uh, replicate intracellularly. This can ha this can basically uh, sum up to two phenotypes, either the bacteria will be killed or that the bacteria will be able to overcome this, replicate, this will cause host cell death at some point, and then the bacteria can disseminate, and then this goes on and off, on and on. Interestingly, this is what also happened at later stages of infection. And if you look at granulomas of this case, in this case, this is a mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is the necrotic tissues that you can see inside the, the granuloma. This is surrounded by macrophages that are infected intracellularly. And again, this protects against antibiotics and uh, adaptive immunity. And this has been um, the line of research for many years to understand what is uh, the molecular mechanisms. And if we uh, dwell into uh, really the intracellular environment, the molecular mechanisms have been, have been studied for many years. On one side, the macrophages, I told you, are, is trying to uh, eliminate the bacteria using a pro-inflammatory program. This includes uh, cytokines that recruit other immune cells, um, other cell autonomous defense mechanisms like ROS and NOS and antimicrobial peptides. All of them are aimed to eliminate the bacteria. And on the other hand, uh, the, the bacteria, as I told you, has learned somehow to recognize this intracellular environment 
and basically uh, using a virulence program, which is usually uh, um, concludes in a, in a secretion system, in the case of Salmonella, for example, a type three secretion system, it secretes uh, effector proteins that subvert uh, macrophage processes in order to establish an intracellular niche. And uh, in our lab, what we are trying to answer, uh, given what I've just shown you, is what I consider are the most important open questions uh, that remain. Um, so if you look uh, at the cellular context, um, we are trying to understand the regulation of the processes. So how do the bacteria recognize that it's inside a macrophage uh, in order to induce its virulence process? We know it's a timely induction, so they don't express these virulence processes all the time. They need to know when they are inside the cells. And what is the regulation on the whole side of these uh, pro-inflammatory processes that allow some cells to kill the bacteria and others don't? Uh, we also look, look at the context of the, the tissue and how the bacterial niche is affected by the interaction between different cell types. So not only macrophages, but how macrophages interact with other cells in order to eliminate the bacteria. And then uh, we are trying to look at the relevance of all this to human disease, uh, especially why do some people get sick and some don't when they are exposed to the same kind of uh, infection. And in a nutshell, what we are trying to do basically in the lab is uh, approach this in a kind of a different approach. Um, if you illustrate how bacterial infection looks like as um, um, infection over time and bacterial load on the y-axis, then you can see that some people will uh, eliminate the bacteria. That means that they will have an infection, but the immune system will kick in and then they will eliminate the infection and uh, leave disease free. However, some people will encounter a bacteria and will become actively infected with life-threatening implications. There is also the option of latency, which I will not discuss here today, but some people will, and, and especially in uh, tuberculosis, they will encounter the bacteria, but they will stay latently infected sometimes throughout your, the lifetime. And while most studies will uh, look at infection at, early, at late stages, meaning they will already study what is going on in infection after symptoms appear, this is especially true in the case of humans, but also for other studies, then what we are trying to do in the lab is look at what we think is a decision point in the course of infection, namely in the very first hours or days of infection. And we are trying to uh, establish models in order to look at uh, early infection. This is, of course, uh, the level of the cellular interactions, but also at early infection in uh, mice models. And finally, the most uh, ambitious one is to look at what happens in, in vivo at human infection at the early stages. So I will show you two projects today. Um, because I don't have a lot of time, then I will go really quickly on this project that was uh, um, basically pioneered by Gilly, a PhD student in the lab uh, that was recently published. So I will go through this really quickly. And then I will try to go through another project in the lab a little bit slower. One of the things that is being realized today is that the pro-inflammatory response of macrophages is, is uh, driven by a metabolic change, a massive metabolic change of the macrophages from oxphosphorespiration to aerobic glycolysis. This entails accumulation of uh, metabolites within the macrophage that uh, basically mediate the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines, the production of mitochondrial rosses, and other uh, pro-inflammatory mechanisms. And in this project, what Gilly wanted to know is what happens to the salmonella within the macrophages when they undergo such a, a huge metabolic change. You have to realize that this intracellular environment is basically what the bacteria senses as its extracellular cues. And uh, one of the things that uh, Gilly did first is basically run a method in the lab called dual RNA-seq. And I will, this is like a really complex uh, figure, but I will just say two sentences about it. Basically, uh, we had to uh, figure out what happens to the bacteria in the intracellular environment once they are doing their metabolic shift. So he used a, a chemical inhibitor in order to prevent the macrophages to undergo the metabolic shift and then probe the intracellular uh, bacteria for its gene expression with the metabolic shift or without the metabolic shift. So this is what you see in the um, uh, white areas and the blue areas. And since this chemical inhibitor also can target the bacteria, then we use the bacterial mutant that cannot uptake this chemical, uh, chemical inhibitor, which is 
this mutant that you can see here on the right in the red uh, dots, in the red uh, um, uh, colors. So in essence, this is without the chemical inhibitor, this is with, in the wild type, this is without and with, in the mutant, and this is in the course of 24 hours, and you can see the induction of genes. Most importantly, here you can see that the chemical inhibitor inhibits the induction of genes that are important for the metabolic shift that uh, basically uh, shows what we wanted uh, to achieve. And then he looked at what happens to the bacteria, and in the wild type, I would just say that you can see that SGRS is induced, which is a, a indica indicative of a metabolic stress. Uh, so these are the cells that are exposed, the bacterial cells that are exposed to the chemical inhibitor. But when we use the mutant, you see that SGRS is no longer expressed. Uh, but what we did find out and we were surprised to find is that the entire type 3 secretion system genes are not induced if you do not allow the metabolic shift to go on. So just to summarize this, this means that the bacteria somehow senses what is, uh, what is going on with the metabolic shift of the macrophage. And it, this allows for a timely gene expression of the bacteria. And we wanted to study the mechanism of this. What we wanted to do first is understand what are the metabolites of the host that the bacteria senses. So we did a metabolics experiment, of course, and we found several metabol metabolites that are um, accumulated upon infection. Most notably, notably, these were succinate, itaconate, citrate, and fumarate. I will now show you the experiments where we actually uh, screened those metabolites to see which one of them is re relevant for virulence gene expression. Uh, but what I will show you is that when we culture the bacteria only with succinate, so in vitro culture of the bacteria grown in, uh, not in LB in, in this case, but in another media uh, with the addition of succinate allows the induction of all the virulence program of salmonella. And this was uh, really surprising. So you can see here growing bacteria with succinate. Um, we can see the induction of the spy 2 as we saw before. This is the type three secretion system and another regulon, uh, which is called PMRAB, which allows the bacteria to protect itself within the intracellular environment from antimicrobial peptides. In order to go in a little bit deeper into the mechanism, what we wanted to understand whether this is through actually a sensing of succinate <clears throat> on the cell wall of the bacteria, or does the succinate need to go into the bacteria? And we did some several more experiments, which I will not elaborate upon. But at the end, what Gilly found is that if you look at succinate uptake by the bacteria, it is important to, uh, 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 there is a transporter that is important for the uptake of succinate. You can see it here, DCUB, a C4 dicarboxy transporter that is important for the uptake of succinate and the induction of virulence genes. I'm sorry if this is really fast, it's just that um, I don't have time to uh, go through all the entire process of uh, that we did here. So finally, in order to show that this is actually important for virulence, what Gilly did is take, uh, depleted this uh, transporter that I just showed you is important for virulence gene induction and infect mice with a mutant transporter. And if you look at the infection uh, a long time, you can see that without this transporter, the bacteria are not able to cause um, infection and they are avirulent in mice without this transporter. So um, just to summarize this uh, part, which I ran through really quickly, uh, the metabolic shift of the macrophages causes the uh, accumulation, really high accumulation of uh, host metabolites. In this case, succinate is important. And what we show is that there is a transporter of succinate through the DCUB that allows timely gene expression uh, in the bacteria in order to survive within the macrophage. And of course, this opens up, this metabolic crosstalk opens up a lot of questions now that we are very busy in uh, looking at. What is the mechanism of succinate-mediated uh, gene induction? So in the host, it's known that uh, succinate can act as a translation uh, modification and uh, basically uh, involved in a uh, transcription factor uh, mediated gene expression in the host cells. We are looking into that, whether this is a molecule that can change gene expression. But uh, in general, what we think that this uh, opens up a new field of metabolic uh, crosstalk where we know already that other metabolites are important in other infection models, and we are also collaborating with other labs to look at that. 
Um, but also more than that is uh, what is the uh, relevance of this entire metabolic crosstalk to the survival within uh, in vivo uh, infection, as I showed you in the last part. Okay, so this was really quick. I will try to be a little bit slower in the second part, uh, which uh, um, is uh, led by Dotan in the lab, a talented PhD student. And here uh, we are trying to look at early infection stages in uh, animal models of infection, in this case in mice, again with Salmonella. And what we are uh, trying to do in this model is to characterize what is going on in systemic infection at early stages. So not through uh, the gut, uh, but uh, at systemic sites, in this case in the spleen. Uh, and we want to understand the dynamics of the bacteria with the host cells. Um, and in order to do that, Dutan applied single cell RNA-seq of the macrophage populations after infection. And then I will show you some functional analysis of the macrophage populations that we found. And uh, you will see that it indicates a really a nice um, collaboration between macrophage subsets and the specific subset that is a replication niche for salmonella. So usually when people look at, as I told you, when people look at infection in the spleen, for example, they look at late stages. And the first thing that we wanted to understand is whether there's an, uh, what, what, go, what goes on in the spleen at early infection, at the really first hours of infection. So we took a time course of uh, mice infection of 48 hours and uh, we looked at what, what is going on in the CFU. So just mushing up the entire C, uh, spleen and seeing how many bacteria survive. And this was already really interesting because you can see that in the first few hours, uh, uh, the first eight hours actually, you can see a reduction in the ability of Salmonella to survive in the spleen. So the host is winning at this phase. But then there starts a second phase where actually the bacteria are able to replicate and they're able to replicate to high numbers and this goes on and on in 48 hours. And if you look at 72, it will go out of the screen and some, at some point the mice will die. Um, and what we wanted to first of all know whether this is something that could be mediated by intracellular replication or is this just extracellular bacteria? So Dutan compared the infection of a wild type bacteria to a SPI2. You already are experts in SPI2. So this is the type three secretion mutant that you saw before. And you can see this, uh, we call this an eclipse like infection dynamics because it looks like an eclipse. So you can see the eclipse in the wild type, but the SPI2 is unable to replicate. This hints to the fact that this is intracellular replication mediated and not extracellular. So if it's intracellular, there's something interesting going on in the host pathogen interaction here. And the next thing that Dutan did is basically sort by fax the spleens uh, for macrophage populations and run single cell RNA on those. And this is how it looks like. Uh, so you guys, I don't need to understand any, uh, to explain anything about single cell RNA-seq. So uh, we infected, uh, we either took naive mice, uh, macrophages from the spleens from naive mice, wild type infected or a Delta spy mut to mutant. This is how the naive um, single cell look like. This is how the infected wild type or Delta spy two. You can see that for the most part, there's not a lot of difference between the wild type and the Delta spy two. And we analyzed uh, using the metacell analysis, which I highly recommend. Um, if you need uh, any explanations, you can uh, privately approach us. Um, and using metacells, we could identify the different cell types that we see here. And we found mainly three uh, cell types. Uh, two are already known. So on the top, you can see the resident red pulp macrophages before infection and after infection with either the wild type or the Delta spy 2 and in the bottom, you can see the classical monocytes before and after infection. But what was really interesting is this here. So we know that there are non-classical monocytes in the spleen, but we don't know that they um, give rise to effector macrophage cells after infection. And you can see that they are infected with intracellular bacteria. So we sorted here on the GFP cells. There, we identified two uh, markers for this population. NR4A1 is a known marker for the classical monocytes, and I, I will get to that uh, in, in a few slides. And the other marker is CD9, which is an extracellular uh, uh, protein, which allows us now to follow this population in the course of infection without the need to do transcriptomics. 
And this is how it looks like. So uh, again, this is the CD11 B fax plots uh, over F480. So these are the macrophage population. These are the red pups that you see at the start of the infection. And actually we found that they die over the course of infection. So they are evident at the four hours and they are lost at the 24 hours. Through further experiments, I will not show you them. We found that actually by eight hours, if you remember this time point, they are completely lost. And we think that these are the cells that are important for the control of infection in the first stage of the eclipse. And I will not show you the functional experiments that we did for that. But what you see is that there is, there is another population that uh, appears after uh, 24 hours. These are the monocytes that differentiate into macrophages. And if you use now the CD9 that we uh, showed that is uh, reminiscent of the CD9 macrophage population for, uh, that arise from non-classical monocytes, you can see that indeed this population is uh, um, um, made of uh, both classical uh, monocytes that give rise to inflammatory monocytes and the non-classical monocytes, the CD9 positive lysine LFD. So in order to show functionally what are these cells, we immediately did bulk RNA-seq on them because in the single cell, you cannot see a lot of things. And we sorted the Li6C positive, the INOS macrophages or the inflammatory monocytes and the CD9 macrophages, and we compared them. And the intracellular environment of these two are completely different, which uh, gave us an idea that maybe these cells are different also in the intracellular environments, meaning Salmonella replication is different between the INOS macrophages and the CD9 macrophages in the second stage of the eclipse that may indicate that they replicate within one of these populations. I will not show you the experiments, uh, sadly, but uh, what we found is that actually, as you would expect, the CD9 macrophages are, uh, could, they contain the replicating Salmonella within them. And I will show you direct one, some direct evidence for that. Uh, you can see here a mouse model, which we got from our collaborator. What we wanted to do in this mouse model is basically to eliminate, to deplete specifically the non-classical monocytes. So in the first slides that I showed you, if you remember, uh, people have already depleted phagocytes in general and showed that they are important for intracellular replication and cause of systemic infection. But here, what, what we wanted to do is to eliminate specifically this a macrophage population that arise from the non-classical monocytes. Uh, you cannot deplete nr 4 one completely. It's an important gene for the inflammatory response, but our collaborator found that a super enhancer in nr 4 one if you deplete this region only, then you get rid of the non-classical monocytes. So these are the naive mice, and you can see that you lose the CD9 population in the naive mice. But what is nicer, even more nice, is that you actually lose this macrophage population after infection. So this is a direct indication that, uh, you know, we started with gene expression that shows that uh, there's a macrophage effector population that uh, is uh, uh, coming from the non-classical monocytes, but this is a direct um, um, indication of that and experimental uh, confirmation for that. And indeed, if you, uh, look now at the CFU of Salmonella within these uh, mice, you can see that uh, Salmonella replicates less in the NR4A1 uh, knockout mice. Um, so this again shows that uh, Salmonella needs these cells in order to establish an intracellular niche uh, in the second phase of the eclipse. So uh, the model basically is that we have this eclipse uh, um, dynamics of infection in the first phase, red pulp macrophages contain the intracellular bacteria, but they die at eight hours. I didn't show you that. Classical monocytes do not seem to play an, a, a, a lot of a role in, in this dynamics of infection. We didn't find the, that they contribute to anything of these dynamics, but the non-classical monocytes, the CD9 macrophages that arise from, there, from them are the intracellular niche for Salmonella and they replicate intracellularly in the second phase. What we actually think is that the Salmonella that are coming out of the red pulp macrophages are taking up, are being taken up by the CD9 macrophages and this is how the infection dynamics goes. But to me, what was most important is this experiment, as I told you, we, are, we at the lab are trying to show that the early stages of infection are important as a decision point for what happens at late stages of infection. And I remind you, these cells, they arise all, already at eight hours after infection. And when we look at the survival of mice from at, at a long infection model, at a longer infection model from 
the infection with salmonella, you can see that actually this really changes uh, the survival of mice after five days of infection. So you can see here the wild type and the NR4A1 uh, mutant that does not contain this um, replication niche for salmonella are protected from infection much more than the wild type mice. Uh, so with this, I want to conclude. I think I was more or less on time. Um, the non-classical monocytes, we show that they give rise to novel macrophage populations. Uh, these are the CD9 macrophages, and we show that they are provided tissue niche for bacterial infection. Um, I did not, I only touched upon this, but there is a nice division of labor between macrophage population in the spin, both with the monocytes that uh, are recruited to this tissue, but also with the resident macrophages. But as I told you, the early events then we show that they actually determine the course of infection in the long run. So, um, yeah, I already went through this. So with that, I would like to really uh, thank my entire lab, uh, our collaborators, the funding. Uh, I would just mention that we are currently actively looking for a postdocs in the lab. And I would like to thank you for listening and for the invitation to come and present our work. Thank you, Roy. That was really great. So the... Uh, time for questions. You can raise your hand, uh, you can switch on your camera, or you can just write the question on the chat. So the time that everyone uh, prepare his question. I can I can start um, about the succinat. Do you have uh, do you know how succinat will be transported within the bacterium, and how how you have the switch? So, um, yeah, the, there's a there's several layers to that. So the succinate is transported through this DCUB transporter that I show you, uh, the C4 dicarboxy transporter. This is, uh, this is the mechanism that we've shown in the paper. Uh, what uh, the open questions that remain are, uh, how does succinate get into the ph phagosome of the bacteria? Exactly. Uh, and there we have some, uh, we have some uh, indications of uh, the mammalian transporter that uh, transports succinate into the phagosome. Uh, so we are actively working on that. Um, you have to realize the levels of succinate accumulation within the cell after the metabolic uh, switch is like 10 millimolars. It's something that is not subtle. This is like huge amounts of succinate. Uh, and there is a transporter in mammalian cells that we are suspecting this is the candidate for that. You know, I have a little bit of difficulty to actually distinguish the checkpoint between succinate and itaconate. No. Uh, how do you yeah. distinguish both of them? You know. So they are very similar molecules, right? Yeah. Uh, and actually. Uh, we know that itaconate is also delivered uh, to the bacteria. So I didn't show you this in the results, but in the dual RNA-seq, one of the genes that we see induced is RIPA. Uh, RIPA is part of the itaconate degradation operon of salmonella. So we know that itaconate gets into the bacteria. Itaconate mm -hmm. is an antimicrobial. Yeah. And RIPA basically, it's a three gene operon that knows how to degrade itaconate. One of the byproducts, by the way, is succinyl-CoA. So there is an interplay between itaconate and succinate in this case. Uh, we don't understand it completely, but uh, definitely there is a relationship between them. In the host, we know that itaconate is a competitive inhibitor on SDH. This is why so the whole cells have to go from uh, oxfos to glycolysis because there is a break in the TCA cycle. So once itaconate yeah. is induced yes. uh, in the macrophage, there is a break in the TCA cycle. The same competitive inhibition goes on in the bacterium. This is why uh, RIP A is induced in order to degrade itaconate and prevent basically uh, the ability of bacteria to metabol uh, use their own metabolism. 
but what exactly is the relationship between etaconate once it's degraded to succinate? Uh, we don't know, but it's a it's an interesting question. Yes. So, uh, Christophe, do you want to go ahead? Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. And so I would have two questions for you. Um, so the first one is linked to this metabolic stuff uh, because there is another paper who has, which has been published beginning of this year uh, where they have also looked at the metabolic shift of macrophages like this, but they are they were more focused on uh, the glycolytic intermediates that were produced and how the glycolysis was affecting actually uh, the salmonella because in their paper they claim to show that it's uh, the sensing by salmonella of some uh, intermediates of, glyco uh, of the glycolysis that are sensed by the bacteria to induce the, uh, the, the expression of SPI2. Um, so I would like to know how this data might overlap with yours maybe because then you you, you propose to also say that some intermediates of the TCA cycles could in, um, induce this activity of the salmonella. And my second question would be for relative to your second project about the uh, spleen and the macrophages. Um, can you link somehow this subpopulation of macrophages to macrophages which are more prone, for instance, to go to a M1 or M2 program? Uh, okay, I will start with the second question. Um, uh, okay, I have to say, you know, this is why it's important to study things in vivo. Uh, when we take cells in culture and we look at what they are doing, then you have to realize this is a very artificial environment. Uh, in vivo, in mice, there is no M1, M2. Um, and I'm, I'm ready to sign on it. Uh, there is no such thing, okay? This happens when you take cells into a plastic dish and you um, and you uh, make them uh, go to a different activation state, but this does not happen in vivo. In vivo, uh, you have many different um, intermediate phenotypes of M1 and 2. Uh, there's no real uh, difference uh, of like M1 gene expression and M2 gene expression that people have so for so many years have been describing. In, when we look at the macrophages that we described, then some of them have a pro-inflammatory um, phenotype that comes together with an anti-inflammatory phenotype. And it's uh, mainly the dynamic uh, of the infection that uh, what time point do you look at and what is the cellular uh, compartment that you look at. So um, it's hard to connect the first part and the second part, okay? It's hard to say, if you look at macrophages in a dish, which they undergo a, a substantial metabolic uh, change uh, and move from completely move from oxfos to aerobic glycolysis, you don't see that in vivo uh, in that in that uh, in that amount. Um, the easy it's pretty easy to look at the metabolic state of macrophages by gene expression. It, it turns out I was surprised, but it's pretty easy to look at the metabolic state of, uh, of macrophages. There are uh, genes that are related that the macrophage basically need um, in order to uh, induce a certain metabolic pathway. So if you like to look at glycolysis, then there's a gene signature that uh, is reminiscent of glycolysis. And if you like to look at oxfos, there's one and the, the peptose phosphate pathway, all of them, uh, you can do that by gene expression. And we've done that. And you can see that the, that the cells are inter in intermediate states. So, you know, when we first started the second project, the first thing that we wanted to see is, well, let's look at the glycolytic cells and figure out whether we can find the virulent salmonella in them. But it's not, it's not black or white, as you see in the tissue culture. That's a problem. So uh, one of the genes that is uh, most reminiscent of this glycolysis, uh, glycolytic shift is the IRG1, the, the gene for itaconate or ACOD1. And it's expressed in all cells. Uh, to, to some, in, some they express it more, some express it less. But it's not black or white. That's the problem. So in order to understand what is going on in the salmonella, I agree. It, 
we have to look uh, deeper into each of these macrophage population. And this is uh, some of the things that we are trying to do now. So it will not be a black and white situation like we see in the tissue culture. And this is why we use tissue culture, right? It's, it allows us to look at uh, things in black or white, but at the end, we have to realize that the reality is a little bit different. That's the first thing. The second thing, um, I don't know which paper you're relating uh, to. This is the Nature Communications paper? Or yes. The, uh, yes. Yeah. yes. So this was a beautiful paper, and I think we, it complements our paper to many, uh, to many levels. So they show that there is an induction of a, a different salmonella um, effector, sub B, uh, which is basically a SPI1. But in their case, this is, uh, they show that it's the other way around, that this actually uh, provides uh, macrophages uh, to go deeper into the glycolysis phase. And we think that these are tied together. We actually think that the transcription factor that they suggest in their paper is actually related to the succinate effect that we see in our cells. And we are testing that now. Uh, but I think these are completely complementary. And uh, I think there was a news and views of the two paper that was really nice. I suggest that you look at it. Uh, that actually tried to tie the two papers together and they did a really good job, I think. Okay, thanks a lot. Are there, are there other questions? Uh, uh, Fabian? Yes, for a second. So hello, thanks again for the great talk. Um, I was also, um, if I have a question to the second part of the story, um, so the non-classical monocytes and the CD9 macrophages, so I was uh, interested in the, in the timing and um, if you see like a, an increase in the population of the CD9 macrophages after infection compared to non-infected mice or like also the other um, kinds of macrophages. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't, I couldn't show all the things. So first of all, this, this work is in bioarchive. So if anyone is interested, is uh, more than welcome to look at it. Um, and the answer, to, you will find the, the answer to your question. And basically what we find is really the dynamics of this eclipse where you see this drop and then the increase. So something happens at eight hours. We don't completely understand it, but at eight hours, it's really a time point where red pot macrophages, the resident macrophages are lost. And then you see a huge increase in the, um, uh, both the classical and the non-classical uh, macrophages. Uh, so uh, we don't know exactly what, so you know, monocytes, it's, it's a little bit catchy because they come, they either come from the bone marrow or they are resident in the spleen. And this really rapid dynamics, uh, you know, it, it begs to differ the question of whether these are cells that are resident in the spleen or cells that are uh, recruited from the bone marrow through myelopoiesis. We don't know the answer to that, but definitely at eight hours, uh, there is a, a very nice change between the uh, shift between the resident macrophages and the monocyte that take over and uh, handle the infection in, 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 uh, instead of them. We don't know what the trigger is in the end. I, I think, well, we, we don't know. <laughs> I think that one of the main things that you can suspect, right? And I, I think that nobody has shown that, but my suspicion is that if cells like red pops are dying massively, then they are basically secreting a lot of inflammatory cytokines like IL-1 beta, like uh, CCL2, like all, all these chemokines that will now uh, cause recruitment of cells. Now, this is a lot of waving of my hands. I didn't show any of this, but I suspect that the death, the cell death of uh, red pulp macrophages is, has something to do with it. We have some, so it's really difficult to, you know, to inhibit the cell death. We have some indications that if we inhib inhibit uh, with a chemical inhibitor, if we inhibit uh, red pulp macrophage cell death, then we have lower recruitment or differentiation of the monocytes into the macrophage effector cells. Uh, but the differences are too subtle. You can see in this uh, paper, you will see that there's a, a figure showing that, but uh, the differences are too subtle to really go and uh, say something significant about this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So Roy, uh, Wilfred and Michaela, thank you for your great talk in the thank chat. Thank you very much. And uh, Arda has a, has a question, so I just read it. Uh, just a quick question on what you think on the trafficking of uh, 
RIG1 uh, to the uh, SCV, uh, how does it move from inside of mitochondria to the SCV? That's a, uh, yeah, that's a wonderful question. It's also related to, the, it's the same for the succinate, right? So IRG1, uh, uh, the itaconate and succinate. Okay, so there was a paper on this. I think I remember that there was a paper that there is a delivery mechanism of the, of the um, metabolites from the mitochondria. I think it was through vesicles. Uh, it was not specific to itaconate and succinate. So there's two, there's two options. Um, succinate is excreted out of the mitochondria. That's for sure. There's a transporter that excretes out the succinate and also itaconate. And then it's the, in the cytoplasm. And uh, the transporter for succinate that we suspect is a, since succinate and itaconate are so similar, uh, is basically a transporter that can also transport a itaconate. Um, it's one of the SLCs. Um, so I don't know if that's true, but I think that there's um, really a dedicated transporter for that, transporters for that. For itaconate, it's reasonable to assume that this antimicrobial would be transported into the phagosome. I don't know why succinate would be uh, transported actively, but um, this is our guess uh, for now. But you have to do some functional genomic and start exploring all the, yeah, yeah, all yeah, the yeah. transporters. Yeah, I agree. I, we know it's a, it's a I think it's a, all of these questions are great questions. I think that functionally, we know very little about what Salmonella does inside the SCV, right? It's a, yeah. I agree. So other, other questions? I just have one to really finish. Uh, Roy, I want to, when you have the splints at, uh, when you initiate infection, like it's such a burden for the mice, right? And the spleen really will expand in size and so on. So how do you exactly distinguish the cells that are resident from the cells that will be, that will be recruited? So, yeah. It's a great question. So, uh, I, okay. So there's a few ways to um, prevent recruitment. So we did the experiments, for example, in CCR2 null mice, okay? So mm -hmm. this will prevent the recruitment of uh, classical monocytes. Uh, and uh, this does not affect at all the infection course. That was really surprising. That's the first yeah. thing. Uh, preventing the recruitment of non-classical monocytes, that's a little bit more trickier. Mm -hmm. uh, the trick we are using there, and this was actually a question of by one of the reviewers of the paper. Is that you, Emmanuel? Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, basically, uh, the the way we so we can prevent the the recruitment of classical monocytes. Uh, in order to look at what happens to, with the non-classical, we did it. Uh, we are now doing this experiment. The trick is is that non-classical monocytes are long-lived, and classical monocytes are short-lived. So. They circulate, they spend like 24 hours and they don't stay. Um, so what we do is we pass trace basically with fluorescent beads in order to see whether these cells are there before infection or they come after infection. Uh, but these are really good questions. Yes, the spleen gets bigger, not at the very first two hours, but at the end at 24 hours, they get bigger. And we know there's a lot of recruitment of cells and all, most of them are monocytes that can become there are classical monocytes that can become non-classical monocytes in the tissue. At the end, we don't think uh, it matters a lot. The functionality of the non-classical monocytes becomes uh, uh, into these effector cells, the uh, CD9 macrophages that are permissive to intracellular replication. And this is the bottom line at the end of the day. Yeah, I think also at 24 hours would be nice to look at the metabolism of lipids. I think of, in your CD, of lipids. It's, yeah, in your CD9 cells, most probably you have huge, uh, huge, uh, huge re reorganization of of the of the metabolism here. Yeah. For lipids, why do you say lipids? Uh, I think normally the maybe they become four macrophages or something like this. Uh, yeah. um, okay, four me macrophages. Um, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the signature of the cells is the CD9 macrophages is definitely at a different metabolic state um, than uh, the inflammatory monocytes. 
I don't know it's a, if it's a classical foamy macrophages um, uh, phenotype. We can look at that. Okay. Great. Roy, was nice to see you. You too. Yeah. Thanks for uh, the invitation and thanks for uh, this lovely um, forum. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so thanks everyone and looking forward to meet you again in two weeks from now. Okay. See you. Bye-bye.